Hey everyone, it is time for Psycho Cybernetics Part 3. This week I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to read you some things from other chapters too, which are, in my opinion, very valuable to know. And I will comment on them as we go. I wish you lots of fun and understanding and all the good stuff with what you're about to hear. The real secret of mental picturing. Successful men and women have, since the beginning of time, used mental pictures and rehearsal practice to achieve success. Napoleon, for example, practiced soldiering in his imagination for many years before he ever went on an actual battlefield. Webb and Morgan, in their book Making the Most of Your Life, tell us that the notes Napoleon made from his readings during these years of study filled, when printed, 400 pages. He imagined himself as a commander and drew maps of the island of Corsica showing where he would place various defenses, making all his calculations with mathematical precision. He imagined himself. Where have we heard imagining before? Conrad Hilton imagined himself operating a hotel long before he ever bought one. When a boy, he used to play that he was a hotel operator. Henry Kaiser had said that each of his business accomplishments was realized in his imagination before it appeared in actuality. It is no wonder that the art of mental picturing has in the past sometimes been associated with magic. However, the new science of cybernetics gives us an insight into why mental picturing produces such amazing results and shows that these results are not due to magic but to the natural normal functioning of our minds and brains. Cybernetics regards the human brain, nervous system and muscular system as a highly complex servo mechanism, an automatic goal-seeking machine that steers its way to a target or goal by use of feedback data and stored information, automatically correcting course when necessary. As stated earlier, this concept does not mean that you're a machine, but that your physical brain and body functions as a machine that you operate. This automatic creative mechanism within you can operate in only one way. It must have a target to shoot at. As Alex Morrison said, you must first clearly see a thing in your mind before you can do it. When you do see a thing clearly in your mind, the creative success mechanism within you takes over and does the job much better than you could do it by conscious effort or willpower. Instead of trying hard by conscious effort to do the thing with ironed-jawed willpower and all the while worrying and picturing to yourself all the things that are likely to go wrong, you simply relax the strain, stop trying to do it by strain and effort, picture to yourself the target you really want to hit, and let your creative success mechanism take over. Thus mentally picturing the desired end result literally forces you to positive thinking. You are not relieved thereafter from effort and work, but your efforts are used to carry you forward toward your goal rather than in the futile mental conflict that results when you want and try to do one thing, but picture to yourself something else. So, Dr. Maxwell Maltz is a bit more rational, as you hear, and he explains the thing that also Seth and Neville teach in a different way, but he says the same. He says if you have a goal, you give it over to the bigger part of you, he calls it automatic success mechanism, and it will find ways and means to externalize this imagination in reality. And if you listen back, you hear that he uses different words. That is what it boils down to. Imagination 
having a clear goal and keep your focus on the goal and stop worrying because if you focus on it's not going to happen then that is the goal you're always going towards something either something that you're afraid of or something that you have faith in there's a saying faith and worry are two sides of the same coin so it's same same but different like you will go either one way or the other and now the next part is everyone hypnotized it is no exaggeration to say that every human being is hypnotized to some extent either by ideas he has uncritically accepted from others or ideas he has repeated to himself or convinced himself are true these negative ideas have exactly the same effect on your behavior as the negative ideas implanted into the mind of a hypnotized subject by a professional hypnotist have you ever seen a demonstration of honest to goodness hypnosis if not, let me describe to you just a few of the more simple phenomena that result from the hypnotist's suggestion. The hypnotist tells a football player that his hand is stuck to the table and that he cannot lift it. It is not a question of the football player not trying. He simply cannot. He strains and struggles until the muscles of his arms and shoulders stand out like cords. But his hand remains fully rooted to the table. He tells a championship weightlifter that he cannot lift a pencil from the desk. And although normally he can hoist a 400 pound weight overhead, he now actually cannot lift the pencil. Strangely enough, in the above instances, hypnosis does not weaken the athletes. They are potentially as strong as ever. But without realizing it, they are working against themselves. On the one hand, they try to lift their hand or the pencil by voluntary effort and actually contract the proper lifting muscles. But on the other hand, the idea you cannot do it causes contrary muscles to contract quite apart from their will. The negative idea causes them to defeat themselves. They cannot express or bring into play their actual available strength. The gripping strength of a third athlete has been tested on a dy dynamometer and has been found to be 100 pounds. All his effort and straining cannot budge the needle beyond the 100 pound mark. Now he is hypnotized and told, you are very, very strong, stronger than you've ever been in your life. Much, much stronger. You are surprised at how strong you are. Again. The gripping strength of his hand is tested. This time he easily pulls the needle to the 125 mark. Again, strangely enough, hypnosis has not added anything to his actual strength. What the hypnotic suggestion did was to overcome a negative idea that had previously prevented him from expressing his full strength. In other words, the athlete in his normal waking state had imposed a limitation on his strength by the negative belief that he could only grip 100 pounds. The hypnotist merely removed his mental block and allowed him to express his true strength. The hypnosis literally dehypnotized him temporarily from his own self-limiting beliefs about himself. As Dr. Barber said, it is awfully easy to assume that the hypnotist himself must have some magical power when you see rather miraculous things happen during a hypnotic session. The stutterer talks fluently. The timid, shy, retiring Casper Milk Toast, <laughs> nice name, becomes outgoing, poised and makes a stirring speech. Another individual who is not especially good in adding figures with a pencil and paper multiplies two three-digit figures in his head. Another individual who is not especially good in adding figures with a pencil and paper multiplies two three-digit figures in his head. 
Apparently, all this happens merely because the hypnotist tells them that they can and instructs them to go ahead and do it. To onlookers, the hypnotist's word has a magical power. Such, however, is not the case. The power, the basic ability to do these things was inherent in the subjects all the time, even before they met the hypnotist. The subjects, however, were unable to use this power because they themselves did not know it was there. They had bottled it up and choked it off because of their own negative beliefs. Without realizing it, they had hypnotized themselves into believing they could not do these things and it would be truer to say that the hypnotist had dehypnotized them to say that he had hypnotized them. Within you, whoever you may be, regardless of how big a failure you may think yourself to be, is the ability and the power to do whatever you need to do to be happy and successful. Within you right now is the power to do things you never dreamed possible. This power becomes available to you just as soon as you can change your beliefs. Just as quickly as you can dehypnotize yourself from the ideas of I can't, I'm not worthy, I don't deserve it, and other self-limiting ideas. Holy moly. Isn't this an amazing chapter? Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to this. He says it all. Hypnotized. Constantly saying to yourself a certain thing hypnotizes yourself into believing that thing. And as you can see, it can happen in a fraction of, of a moment because this man didn't, the, the hypnotist, he didn't um, affirm for five weeks in a row every morning, every afternoon and every night. He did it probably, probably within an hour. So the thing here is, believe it is possible, believe that you can do it yourself and that it's easy to do because it's all about what you believe is possible and the more you play with this the easier it gets and don't forget to have fun because if it's if it's work you know of course there are times that you don't feel like uh, affirmations or meditations or whatever you do to keep yourself in a certain state or to bring yourself in a state that is not yet mm, comfortable for you or trusted or normal for you but mostly it should be fun you know you will get where you want to be eventually so you might as well have fun along the way this is it for this week. Um, these were both not from chapter one. Um, these were random pages. Well, random, nothing is ever random. Pages that I opened in the book, Psycho Cybernetics. I decided to buy the book uh, before I was reading from my computer from a PDF file. And I can highly recommend it to buy the book. And if you are doing so, and if you're planning to read it yourself, uh, read it with the knowledge of Seth and Neville in the back of your mind. Because as I said, Dr. Maxwell Maltz is a bit more rational. I like the magical approach better of Seth and Neville. They ring more true for me. And it's of course also kind of like a sign, sign of the times um, when Maxwell Maltz wrote this. They had to this book had to fit into the beliefs of the people of that time and it was already pretty far out. So, that's it for this week. I wish you a wonderful day and I see you soon. Much love. Ciao.